Okay, thanks Fabio for the introduction and uh, also thanks for mentioning my podcast. And uh, first of all, I want to remind to everybody that we are raising money for the uh, Italian Red Cross. You're going to find all the links on Facebook and on uh, our Instagram page. Okay, so what I'm talking about today, I want to give you a bird's eye view on uh, retraining the injured athlete. Okay, I want to give you a few tips and uh, what I think that uh, could be very useful in order to planning and planning the return to competition. And uh, I'm gonna give you a few tips that I think you can apply to all levels. So uh, whether you're working with a professional team or uh, with an under 14 team, you're gonna, you can apply these uh, this tips. First of all, we must understand that uh, injuries remain a frequent consequence of sport, no matter how good your intervention is, how good your system is, your player is gonna get hurt, of course. And uh, all the players gonna experience uh, an injury during their careers. Most of the time injuries occur uh, through trauma or through like trying to achieve a better performance, like uh, for example, getting hurt uh, while working out. We all know that when uh, one of our players uh, get hurt, there is a reduction of his performance, of course, and also a reduction in, uh, in time on the court and uh, a remove, um, there is time removed from competition, of course. And this is a really, really hard time for an athlete, especially for a professional athlete that is on the court. Uh, I don't wanna say 24 seven, but most of the time he's on the court. First of all, as a practitioner, we must understand that we cannot find a, a plan of attack once the injury uh, already have a court. So we must have a plan and we must have it up front. What does it mean? Uh, like just as mentioned before, we must know which are the most common injuries in our, in our, uh, in our field. For example, for basketball, we, we must know um, everything about like ankle rehab, low back pain and, and knee rehab, which are the most common injuries in basketball. And we must have a plan. And uh, second thing, we must know who are the, um, the, the people that will be around the, the athlete who wants to get hurt. And we're gonna have an athlete, of course, the coach, doctor, physiotherapist, strength and conditioning coach, a nutritionist, and a psychologist. Of course, not everybody's gonna have all these roles, but uh, I think that this is what um, a, a very good performance department should look like. For example, in Jerusalem, we don't have a psychologist, okay? So we, we also miss something here. But this is what it should like, in my opinion. One, we must notice that just one person never vary, uh, no matter the level where we work in. And this person is the athlete. And this is the reason why I think we should have a, an athlete center approach. So the athlete should always be, um, uh, in the center of uh, everything that, that goes around uh, injury rehab program. And we should have uh, this kind of approach, this kind of philosophy. So one athlete, one program. We should tailor the program around this guy. Who's the quarterback? Here I wanna tell you like a little difference between an interdisciplinary approach versus a multidisciplinary approach. So this difference might, be, might look uh, like a semantic difference, but uh, it actually uh, signals the, the shift from um, like a silo, a silo approach where all the members of the staff have um, a different opinion, a different plan uh, to uh, um, an approach where everybody's on the same page. We all work together in order to reach the same goal, which is the return to play of our athlete. We must understand that uh, there will be a lot of uh, element of a uh, crossover uh, in terms of input during the rehab of our athlete. This is, for example, uh, the, uh, the time, the recovery time of an ankle injury. And we see that in the early phases, this guy, this athlete is gonna work a lot with the physiotherapist. But uh, going day by day, we see that also the strength coach is working a little bit. And then the intervention of the strength coach increases day by day till reaching the last part where we basically just work with, we are basically the only ones who are working with, uh, with the athlete and the intervention of physiotherapy is, uh, is really low. 
We don't want to have weak links. We don't want to have weak links and we want to be consistent in our approach and uh, we must have unity within the team. Most of the time, our athletes pay, um, pay um, a huge price if there's no communication uh, among the, the performance department, if there's no communication between the strength and conditioning department and the coaching staff. And we absolutely don't want this to happen, especially when we talk about prof the professional world, because uh, when an athlete maybe is supposed to go back to play in, uh, let's say for example, three, month, uh, three weeks, and uh, just because there is a lack of a communication within the staff, he goes back to play in four weeks instead of three, we can understand that this guy is gonna miss one or two or three games according to the level where he plays. And those three games that he misses are like um, lost money. So we're losing money. And so this absolutely cannot happen in the professional world. Uh, this is the first thing that, uh, the first challenge that everybody faces when a player gets hurt. So what I'm talking about, I'm talking about the player's expectations. Okay, so Doc, how long until I'm back? This is the question that everybody asks to, to, the, um, to the doctor and to the performance staff. How can we answer to this question? First of all, we must explain the injury very well. In order to do that, first of all, we must ensure a correct diagnosis. We must understand um, what kind of injury our player had a uh, head. And of course, before uh, giving um, timelines, we must have a discussion with the entire uh, performance department. Second, we must dissociate from the stresses and the pressure. We understand that the stresses can come from uh, different sources. So they can come from the media, if we're talking again about, about um, the professional level, they, think they can come from uh, the player's environment, they can come from the management, and they can come from uh, the coaching staff. We must dissociate from that. And uh, stressing can also come from the, the relationship that uh, we have with our player. Maybe our player is our friend, so that, that could be a pressure. Third, we must explain the process, okay? We must explain the process again to the athlete, to the management, and um, to the player, we must provide a spectrum of uh, um, best to worst case scenarios to all the members of the, of the team, basically. And last, we must have the right mindset. Having the right mindset, I will go back to this point uh, later on during the presentation, I think is key during the rehab process. Let the hazard ask questions. I have quest questions. We must understand that the athlete will have uh, periods of uh, where, where um, he's, going, he's not going to understand maybe fully the diagnosis and the uh, prognosis. And uh, if our athlete doesn't understand the diagnosis and the prognosis, maybe it will develop anxiety. And this is something that we absolutely don't want. So just take some time and allow some time for the athlete to ask questions and, and try to answer all the questions of your athlete. And every time you have to remember that he is his own CEO. So he needs to take care of, him, of himself and uh, he, he needs to know everything that happens around him. Always think about injury as an opportunity. I think this is paramount when we talk about injury rehab. What, uh, what I mean, uh, we can improve the injury risk profile during the rehab process. We, we can improve the physical capacity of our athlete during the rehab process. We must um, improve the, the, the movement quality of our, of our athletes, for example. And uh, we must improve also the tactical, tactical awareness. This is one of my players that I always mention when I talk about injury rehab. This is a short video. This player last year uh, had a, a bone fracture in his wrist. And he came to me during the rehab process and he said, listen, man, I, I need to be out for, uh, for three weeks, four, four weeks, I will be sidelined. And uh, I wanna improve my leisure movement. I wanna improve as a, as a defensive player. I wanna improve my crossover step. So let's prepare a plan of attack. Let's come up with a plan. And uh, he, he actually works his ass off, worked his ass off during the rehab process. And when he came back on the court, 
he became one of our best defensive players. And he definitely took the injury as an opportunity. And then we must understand that we should involve also the coaching staff in the rehab process. So the players, the players that are injured must be part of the team. For example, here in Jerusalem, one of the things that we always do is that is um, requiring the athlete, the injured athlete to be on the court during practice. We don't want him to work with a physiotherapist or with me, with a strength coach during practice. He must be there. Maybe he can also give some suggestions to the coaching staff. You know, he, he has a, a different point of view than the coaching staff. So maybe he can come up with something very, very interesting and helpful for the entire team. And also during games, we always want our injured players to sit next to the coaching staff. We never allow one of our injured players to sit, sit at the end of the bench and uh, where maybe he can get distracted by physiotherapists, by fans, by doctors. We always want him to be involved in the game and feel himself part of the team. Again, I'm going back to the mindset. I think having a positive mindset is paramount when we talk about injury rehab. We want the endocrine health of our player always to be high, to be up and to be high in order to maintain an anabolic state. Of course, if uh, we talked about this yesterday with uh, Cristiana, if uh, one of our players develop anxiety can lead to maybe depression. And if, if our players has depression, it's gonna produce a lot, a high amount of um, um, cortisol, for example. So his rehab process won't be the same and it won't be uh, successful eventually. So rehab, we must understand a few things before planning the rehab. First of all, we must un completely understand the type of injury, okay? As I said before, we must, talk, we must know, we must have uh, a clear view of all the most common injuries in our, in our field. And second, we must be ready for, uh, for the intervention and we must know what kind of intervention each provider will have with, uh, with our player. And, uh, and then we always have, the, um, we always need our intervention to be tissue specific and functional as much as possible. Another thing that we should understand during a rehab process is that we won't have a linear progression, a, a linear improvement of our, uh, of our athlete. We must understand and we must take into consideration that this process will be most likely haphazard. So it will have uh, like bad days, good days, and uh, days when, um, where he, he will be able to push a little bit more and days when we gonna need to slow the process down. And uh, so we need to be ready to adjust our program and tweak our program every day on a regular basis. Another very important thing is to understand the healing times. The healing times are well, uh, well established and they are something that we should study and we should know. And um, knowing the healing times would allow us to be a little bit more aggressive with, uh, with our protocol, but always being safe, okay? Always keeping in mind that our player must be safe and must be, uh, must be safe throughout the, the entire rehab. So we started talking about rehab planning a little bit. First of all, we must know the sport. Again, I will go back to this point later on during the presentation, but we must know the sport. We must know what kind of sport um, our athlete does, our athlete play, and we must also know the position of our athlete. Second, we must have a, a well-documented baseline measures. Why I say this? Because uh, when our player will go back on the court, we want him to have reached the baseline measure, and maybe sometimes we want him to be even better than before. And uh, according to the level where you operate, you can have a different baseline measure. Maybe you don't have all the equipment that just just uh, just as, um, showed us before, but maybe you you can measure the, uh, like the girth of the legs of your of your athlete. Okay, maybe you can ha you have a stopwatch and you can you can uh, you can measure the the speed of your athlete. Also, those are baseline measures, and uh, once you, your athlete go back on the court, you can uh, compare those measures with the new measures that you have after the rehab process. 
again, we don't want our athlete to, to have monotony and uh, we don't want our athletes to be stale during the rehab process. Why I say this? Because oftentimes we see athletes that can, that can hurt, that get hurt, and maybe they have to miss, uh, I don't know, let's say one month or two months. What we do, maybe we don't have time, we don't have an assistant as a, as a strength coach. So the easiest thing to do is say, okay, for the first two, week, two weeks, you go, uh, in the weight room and you're going to do like just bench press or bicep cars and this is something first of all this is something that we don't want for second i don't think it's it's something professional and third we must keep in mind that we're just wasting time if we give this to the app we must understand that uh, um we must be progressive loading and uh the the structure and we must be functional as much as possible even though I understand that sometimes during the rehab process, we should also not be so functional, let's say, and we should target muscles like the example here on the left, but always keeping in mind that at the end of the day, we must be able and we must target and, um, and focus on, train, on the movement training. Now, just to summarize a little bit what I said so far, well, we, which are the aims of the rehab planning? First of all, we want uh, uh, the pre-injury physical and emotional level, okay? We want to reach this level, if not exceed this level, as I said before. Second, we want to prevent pre-injury. And uh, of course, something that we absolutely don't want is our player to go back on the court and get hurt after one week, two weeks, three weeks. Or even uh, we don't want our player to get to get hurt again during the rehab process. Absolutely, it's something that we should avoid. Uh, we should prevent overall deconditioning. Okay. Um, another thing about this, we always should think about abilities and not disabilities during the rehab process. Uh, we must understand that, for example, if one of our players um, roll his ankles, sprain his ankle, he still has the the entire body that can work. So we, we should keep the rest of the body well conditioned in order for, for the body, again, to be ready to increase the load once he will be able to weight bearing and to run and then to jump and so on. So, um, fourth, we should eliminate, eliminate risk factors. Again, going back to considering uh, an injury as an opportunity, we also know that um, sometimes an injury can come from uh, a risk factor. For example, if we roll in our ankle, maybe we have a, a lack of dorsiflexion, we have a lack of uh, knee stability, hip stability, hip mobility. So maybe we, sh we want and we should address those factors in, or in order to eliminate the risk factors. And again, we should have, should have a clear path. And this clear path should be a format that we want to uh, develop and we want to share with all the members of the staff, the entire management and the effort. But if we have a clear path, we must know every day where the athlete is, where the athlete is in the rehab continuum. What he needs to move on, of course, to get better and to keep improving during, um, along the continuum. And then we must create a series of, series of wins. Uh, our athlete, especially going through the rehab process, uh, wants to win every day, okay? Wants to see that uh, every day he's able to do something more, he's able to do something better. Like uh, Carlo was saying yesterday, we want our athlete to experiment a lot of things during the rehab process. And uh, if every day he sees himself uh, able to, he finds himself able to do something more, uh, do uh, like uh, maybe even a lower squat, for example, or running a little bit faster, that's a win for him. And uh, it's really important, especially for, for a mindset, in order to have a great mindset. Program planning. Um, we must understand that, that adaptations require both stimulus and recovery. Why I say this? Because we need to periodize as best in the best possible way, the, re the rehab process. We must always understand that too much work, maybe they can, can hurt again our player, but too little can hurt our players as well. 
So we should find that optimal spot where our athlete can uh, thrive during the rehab process. Again, our uh, progression along the rehab uh, continuum should be, um, should be uh, reaching uh, functional movement and a new, uh, achieving uh, new functional, functional um, skills instead of being time-based. Why I say this? Because uh, sometimes we have read in the book that in order to recover from maybe an ankle sprain, it takes three weeks. But then in reality, once we reach the third week, sometimes we feel, we feel and we notice that our athlete is not really re ready to go. So what I have here, this is the, these are the exit criteria including in hamstring rehab. So in order for an athlete to move from phase one to phase two to phase three, and then eventually to phase four, we must check all the boxes. If we don't check all the boxes, our rapid won't go from the first phase to the second phase. Okay, let's talk briefly about uh, program planning. Uh, a program must have uh, different stages. These are the same stages that also Christiana talked about yesterday. The first phase is the acute phase, second phase, reconditioning phase, third phase, return to sport. So briefly, I'm gonna break it down. I'm gonna explain all the phases. First one, acute phase. We must promote tissue healing. And again, as I said before, avoid deconditioning. And now we must understand that in the acute phase, immobilization could be detrimental for, uh, for example, uh, muscle tone and, uh, and strength. And uh, we must also understand that a athlete is not, let's say, a normal person, he's an athlete, so he has to go back on the court as fast as possible. So we cannot allow a period of immobilization, of course. And then we also know, because of a lot of literature, that early mobilization contributes in the, for example, collagen reorganization. And so it should be really, really wise to load the tissues and the injured structure um, as soon as pain uh, allows us to do it. Why I said pain? Because, uh, for example, in the first, in the early stages of the acute phase, we're gonna hammer away at uh, isometrics with our athletes. Isometrics are very important in order to increase again our uh, our strength, and uh, they also have a, a very very important pain inhibitory effect. And uh, other things that, for example we can use during the acute phase is another thing, another tool that we can use. And I'm trying, I'm starting to implement right now in my rehab phase, my rehab processes is a uh, blood flow restriction. Okay. It allows us to keep a, a good muscle tone and uh, we can increase our strength, even though we're not using the same amount of blood that we were, that uh, we were used to use before. Excuse me. So again, in the acute phase, of course, we want to return to weight bearing. Again, maybe you don't have access to all these tools, but if you have, it's really important before going back to running, maybe to uh, spend some time uh, in the swimming pool, running in the swimming pool, swimming pool, and changing direction in the swimming pool, skipping in the swimming pool, sliding in the swimming pool. And uh, if we're lucky enough, maybe you also have access to anti-gravity treadmills like um, likely I have. And that's, that's a very, very important tool that we can use uh, before going back on the court. Acute phase, resistance training. I think resistance training is also very, very important in the acute phase. Why I say this, first of all, it restores balance in our body. Second, it can uh, it help us develop the reflex control. Third, redevelopment of a neuromuscular control. Fourth, development of strength and endurance in the injured tissue. So all of them are really, really important. And uh, these are two very, very important interventions that I think should, should uh, undergo as, early, as, um, as soon as possible during the rehab process. The first one, it's a psychological intervention in order for the athlete to have a well-being. Again, most of the teams, also my team, don't have a psych psychologist. But uh, also as a strength and conditioning coach, 
I can do this kind of intervention having the right mindset. As I said before, being positive, think about the, the injury as an opportunity to improve, to address some weak links, uh, to improve our player's craft, and uh, so be positive. The second one, nutritional intervention. This is very, very important. If we have the chance to work with a nutritionist, that's huge, but uh, this should be a great and a very important component of our rehab process, especially because we want our player, our injured player, to fuel this body with the best uh, source possible and uh, in order to, for the rehab uh, process to be completed and in order for his structure to be completely healed. Reconditioning phase. I call this phase two. We should go through a greater load progression, always keep in mind to keep track of the load. As I said before, too much will, uh, get, will hurt our player, too little will, uh, will hurt our player again. And uh, for example, here there's an example of the greater load progression for a player that was out for less than three months. During week one, we want him to practice, um, so to, to run, for example, for one day and then rest for two, week two, run for one day and uh, rest for one and so on. During the reconditioning phase, we wanna address, of course, cardiorespiratory capacity. We want uh, our um, uh, aerobic capacity to go up because we all know that this can, uh, can avoid injuries, of course. And uh, we, wanna, we wanna address neuromuscular training um, as far as uh, strength training, uh, uh, mobility training, and uh, explosive training. Another thing that we should keep into consideration is that each structure uh, has a, its own time for a reco a recovery time. For example, here we have tendons and we know that tendons take, um, it takes two or three days for a tendon to recover after a, a high-low day. And this is an example of a high-low approach during a tendon rehab process. We, so if we have a, a high-low day, then we, have a, we need to have a moderate or a low-low day after that one. And this is something that we always have to keep in mind. But of course, what does a high-low mean? Uh, what does high-low mean? We, uh, it's different. It's different if we're working with, uh, with a swimmer of, uh, or uh, with a rugby player, of course. Of course, for them, a high load would be completely different. Okay, another thing that we should address during uh, the re uh, reconditioning phase is uh, proprioce proprioceptive work. We all know that uh, injury can uh, disrupt our um, ability to have a fit work, a fit forward and a feedback. So we should uh, work on uh, proprioception Stressing, stressing the joints in uh, multiple positions on multiple surfaces, again, exterior forces, changing cogn cognitive load and decision making. When, uh, when should we do uh, proprioceptive training? Uh, I like to do this early on during the, um, during the rehab process. I like to do it uh, at the very beginning of, uh, of the workout or uh, of the practice. So I want my athlete to be fresh but uh, as soon as I progress during the, the rehab, I want him to experience some proprioception in a, in a state of fatigue, okay? So maybe I want him to do some uh, bonus work, some proprioception uh, after a practice or after a workout or uh, after a treadmill run or uh, after fat fatiguing his system uh, on a bike, okay? We, we are arrived to phase three, last phase of our rehab process. Once our athlete has reached this level, it should be uh, competent with, uh, with most of the movements on the court, and he, he, must, he should be, and he must be very, very confident. We, we must also understand that during this phase, phase three, there's a lot of excitement. excitement. There is a lot of excitement uh, coming from the athlete, from the coaching staff, from the fans, and from the media, from everybody, and this is the time when uh, we have the highest risk of re-injury. So we should be really, really, really careful. Um, how do we decide when our player will go back on the court, is ready to perform, is ready to play? Uh, we can use this. This is called a start, which stands for a strategic assessment of risk and risk performance. 
and uh, it's divided into three steps. Uh, once we reach and we check all the boxes of these three steps, we know that our athletes don't have a, a risk of a re-injury and uh, we can clear our athlete for, uh, for the competition. I'm gonna break, it down, break down all the, all the steps for you guys. So first one, evaluation of health status. Of course, we wanna know if our, if our athlete is, uh, is healthy right now in order to progress and to allow him to play a game. Here you can see we, know, we wanna know if our athlete, for example, still has uh, symptoms and uh, we wanna know if uh, there are some findings in the physical exams, et cetera. The second step, evaluation of participation risk. We must know again the type of sport because uh, if a athlete, uh, again, let's go back to uh, an ankle sprain, but if an athlete sprains his ankle and maybe he plays dart, we know that he can go, he can go back on playing before than a, than a basketball player, of course. We must also know the position that our athlete plays because for example, if our athlete is a point guard or if our athlete is a center, they're gonna have a complete different approach to the game, a complete different load, complete different movements on the court. So this is something that I need to know. And then of course, I need to know the limb dominance, the competitive level. And uh, for example, if I play in the EuroLeague or if I play on a under 15 basketball, that's completely different. We're gonna, uh, I'm gonna have a different load, different stress. And of course, I need to know if the ability to protect of my player. Maybe my player has access to, for example, pads, or uh, we always have um, a physiotherapist in our uh, facility that can, for example, uh, taper athlete, or maybe we don't. And this is something that we should take into consideration. Step three, uh, decision modifiers. What are the decision, decision modifiers? First of all, the timing of the season. Of course, we all know that if our best player, uh, again, roll his ankle four days before game seven on the season final, he's gonna play, he's gonna play. Even though we read in the books that it should take three weeks. We don't care, we must, we must uh, make uh, the best possible in order for him to play. But uh, if the same injury occurs during the preseason, well, we know that maybe this athlete will take, uh, will stay out, will be sidelined for maybe three, four, five weeks because we want him to be ready for the rest of the season. Again, as I said before, pressure from, from athlete, we must know what uh, his uh, emotional status is, external pressure, uh, masking of injury, conflict of interest, and so on, fear of litigation, and so on. Again, we should try to remove all the guesswork. Okay, no guesswork in this, in this uh, period of time during the rehab process. So we return to competition. We should divide return to competition into two parts. First one is being fit to play. Second one is being fit to perform. First, uh, I'm gonna briefly explain um, what fit to play means. First of all, we want to know if our athlete is sufficiently healed, okay? This is something we, we wanna know. Uh, probably is not going to be 100% healed, but we must, we must know if he is sufficient, sufficiently healed or not. Second, we must know if our athlete still feels pain or not. Even though it's not a perfect indicator, this is something that we should know. Uh, third, third one, healing times. Again, uh, if we know the healing times, we know if we have reached that goal or not. We, we, we definitely need to know that. Four, we must know that if our athlete has reached uh, his previous strength, his previous, previous power, his previous uh, range of motion. Okay, before returning to competition, this is something that we should address. This is something that Dr. Ramsey uh, talked about yesterday, and uh, it's the spikes of the acute uh, chronic workload ratio. We don't want to spike. We know that this ratio doesn't, doesn't really predict injuries, but of course, if we have a spike once our, our, coach, our player uh, have returned to competition, we know that we haven't uh, expo exposed our athlete to the right amount of load during the rehab process. And this is something that we don't want to happen. We should expose our athlete to the right amount of load in order for him to withstand the, the load that, that he's gonna uh, experience during games and uh, once uh, he, he returned to competition. 
how can we do to avoid the spike uh, with a further progression uh, of the load after the return to play and with a reducing of the load from a uh, reintegration, which also translate in uh, maybe uh, playing, the, uh, playing this athlete for just half of the game, or maybe sit this player for one or two practices during, uh, during the, the week, or maybe sit the player out before the, the end of the practice during the week in order for his load uh, to, be, to be good and not have uh, this kind of spike during the rehab. Uh, now we talk about fit to, to perform. What does it mean? Uh, in order to be able to, to perform, our athlete must be, um, must be ready to do all the movements that uh, happen on the court. So he must be ready to accelerate. He must be ready to decelerate. He must be ready to change direction. He must be ready, of course, to, um, to jump, to land. And uh, we must assess every aspect of the game. But in order for us to do that, we must know the game, okay? We must exactly know the game because we must understand that even though two, two different athletes have the same injury, uh, if we have a sprinter or we, we have a, a, a basketball player, the rehab cannot be the same, okay? Even though they suffered the same injury. So we must exactly know the same and know the game and this is also the reason why we call ourselves basketball strength and conditioning coaches and not just uh, strength coaches last thing we don't want our athlete to have a sense of lack of complete integration when he goes back on the court uh, if he has a, a lack of complete integration he feels a lack of a complete integration he would put too much attention to the uh, uh, harmed area and uh, if he puts too much attention in the this area he will develop some form of uh, anxiety and if he develops some form of anxiety his performance will drop down and once the performance goes down he will be most likely prone to to get hurt again and this is something that we cannot allow the last thing i want to close with this when does the player go back to play the rehab is complete just when the app is perceived it to be complete completed so the last word is uh, of the player, of course. And uh, we must be good enough, our rehab process must be good enough in order for the player to buy into our program, to trust us, and to be confident enough that he's ready to go out there and perform again like he was used to. Okay, this is some uh, bibliography that I used for this presentation. I will be uh, very, very happy to share it with you if you guys are gonna email me. And uh, I wanna, leave you with uh, this quote from uh, my favorite player uh, ever. And uh, this is it.